Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today to uh, introduce you to Broadcom in a more broad sense. You've obviously known some of the pieces of Broadcom through CA Brocade, but I'm here to kind of give you a, an overview of where we came from, how we got to where we are today, and where we're headed in the future. So if you look at where we are today first, before I get into the history, which is in the next slide, um, we've grown substantially, mostly through acquisition. There's been several major acquisitions that have occurred to create this conglomerate of companies that we are today. In fiscal year 18, last year, we did almost 21 billion in revenue, and that was even before the acquisition of CA. So uh, 19 will do much better than that as well. Um, but we're all about creating world-leading intellectual property and technology. We have a portfolio of over 22,000 patents that have come from some of the most fundamental inventions in this entire technology industry, which you'll see in the next slide when you look at the heritage. The company is structured as 21 today, as 21 independent operating divisions, each with its own general manager uh, who runs that division and takes full P&L responsibility for it and reports into the CEO of the company, Hawk Tan. Uh, we are a major uh, R&D investor. In fact, I think we are the third largest R&D investor in this entire semiconductor industry, although now we are not purely a semiconductor company. That's, how, that's more our origins. Uh, we invest about $3.8 billion a year. I think the only companies that invest more, Intel is number one on the list, and I think Qualcomm is number two. We're number three in Texas Instrument, number four. Uh, so... Philosophically, uh, let me, before I talk about the products that we actually do, I want to give a, a brief introduction to our history, because I think it's pretty important to, to understand where we came from to see where we are headed going forward. The middle bar here is the core uh, of the company as it was created. It starts all the way back on the left with Hewlett Packard back in 1961. It was one of the early pioneers in the technology industry uh, based in Silicon Valley. In fact, the name Silicon Valley came out of a lot of the pioneers, Hewlett and Packard themselves. Um, the company then spun out its test and measurement group and semiconductor division in 1999 as Agilent Technologies. And then in 2005, Agilent decided to spin out the semiconductor products group of, of, it, of the company into a separate company called Avago, Avago Technologies. That occurred uh, via private equity investors. They came to Agilent, bought the semiconductor division, and spun it out. And as good private equity investors do, this is Silver Lake Partners and KKR, uh, to maximize the bottom line of their investment, they came up with the brilliant idea to domicile the company in Singapore. Uh, this was all obviously Hewlett Packard is a California-based company. But they said, well, we, if, we re, if we domicile the company in Singapore, we'll pay less taxes, create more bottom line profits for the company. So it was their idea to uh, domicile in Singapore. And that's what happened when the company was spun out in 2005. It was still operated out of Silicon Valley, but uh, officially domiciled in Singapore. Then they went public in 2009, and then they started doing several major acquisitions. The first major one was the Top Thread, a company called LSI, which was also a conglomerate of, of several companies. All the way go to the left, AT&T Bell Laboratories was the origins of a major par portion of the company. Uh, of course, AT&T invented the transistor. And uh, it was obviously a pioneer in the semiconductor industry. That was later changed into Lucent Technologies, which also owned the semiconductor group. That was changed again into a gear systems in 2002, and then acquired by LSI Corporation, which had its histories back in LSI Logic back in 1981. So they were acquired by Avago Technologies in 2014. Then in 2016, 
Avago approached Broadcom. I am the co-founder of Broadcom Corporation, the, the 1991 version of Broadcom. That's the company that I co-founded. A um, little background there as well. As you heard uh, in the introduction, I uh, earned my degrees at UCLA. Then after I graduated with my PhD in 1980, 1980, I went out to work in the defense industry at a company called TRW in Redondo Beach, which is now part of Northrop Grumman. And I spent five years there working on defense broadband communication systems, in particular satellite communications uh, and military radio communications. So I learned a lot about broadband communication systems while at TRW. Then I received an offer to go back and become a professor at UCLA, which was too good to turn down, uh, even though I had to take a 30% cut in pay. But to be a professor at UCLA is a pretty amazing opportunity. So I took that. But then uh, as part of my research program at UCLA, I started looking at ways to take all that knowledge that I had gained as an engineer at TRW and figure out ways to take these complex digital communication systems and shrink them down into lower cost semiconductor chips. And did that with the funding of DARPA. In fact, DARPA was the major funding source of uh, my research program at UCLA. In some sense, I view DARPA as the venture capitalist that created Broadcom Corporation. Um, so with all the research that we did there, ultimately ended up with uh, some of my PhD students spinning out Broadcom and starting the company in 1991 and built it up nicely over the next 25 years and was acquired by Avago. And Avago chose to take on the name Broadcom. So the company today is Broadcom Inc., um, largely due to my arm twisting of the CEO, Hock Tan. But he, he recognized that you know, Broadcom had created a wonderful brand over the 25 years and uh, was worth keeping the name. So that's why the company today is still called Broadcom. Then we acquired Brocade Communication Systems in 2017. And that got us into more system level products. At Broadcom, prior to that date, we were largely semiconductor-based products. Still did a lot of software with the semiconductor products. Uh, chips these days are so complex. There's an enormous amount of embedded software that goes with it. But it wasn't until we, the acquisition of Brocade that th you, th we ended up with system-level products with significant software content. And that really branched us off into a new direction in multiple respects. Uh, first of all, getting us more into the software space, but also first finally coming to the realization that being domiciled in Singapore was not a good idea. Um, as we planned our future, we saw we were going to do more and more acquisitions, and most, in fact, all of the acquisitions are great US-based corporations. And being even though we were operating out of the US, being a Singapore domicile company didn't make sense. We could see we're going to start running into problems because each acquisition would have to get approved by the US government, by uh, the organization CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US. Uh, we went through that process with Broadcom, went through that process with Brocade, and then realized that it's getting more and more challenging and finally hit us in the face when we attempted to acquire Qualcomm. That was also in 2017. And we thought we had a, a really good story for why it made sense for us to acquire Qualcomm. But Qualcomm was the first hostile acquisition we had tried. All the other acquisitions were friendly and everything was great. We went in arm in arm to the government agencies to tell the great story. But with Qualcomm, it was a hostile acquisition. And as a result, they put up every possible defense they could do, including a major negative smear campaign against us. And number one on the list of the smear campaign is Broadcom's a Chinese company. Um, they didn't know the difference between China and Singapore, but it didn't matter. We're, we were an Asian company. Um, so uh, it did a lot of damage to the, to the reputation of, of Broadcom. And ultimately, the deal was not approved. The president vetoed it. Um, so 
at the same time, we very quickly realized we needed to redomicile in the U.S., and we actually were the first company post the new tax reform package that was put through by the president to decide to redomicile here. In fact, we did a major ceremony in the Oval Office with President Trump announcing our intention to redomicile. Um, so the new tax reform law did play a, a major role in our decision to redomicile, coupled with the fact that our growth trajectory pretty much mandated that we really needed to be a US-based corporation. Even though we're operating out of the US, we need to be officially domiciled. So we went through that process, finished it in early 2018, and are now operating as a US company here. And when we did the acquisition of CA last year, we did it as a US company and sailed through the approval processes uh, very quickly as a result. Now, you look at the, the history you can see here, some amazing uh, companies. In fact, it's kind of coincidental that CA Technologies was co-founded by uh, Charles Wang. And Charles also happened to own the NHL team, the, the uh, New York Islanders. So I knew Charles very well. We both sat on the NHL Board of Governors. And uh, so there must be some tie between the NHL and hockey and owning a tech company. And I, my view is it's probably because we like to fight with our competitors a lot. Um, it, it's probably true. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting coincidence there uh, that I share that background with, with Charles. Um, so if you look at this going forward, and you can see why now we have a, a pretty amazing portfolio of intellectual property, the 22,000 patents in our portfolio coming from this heritage of history going back you know, 50 years in the technology industry that builds the foundation of where we are going forward. So if you look at the company and how it's structured, four major segments of businesses. We have 21 individual lines of business, but they're kind of collected into four major segments. The first is the data center, which is largely what affects uh, most of you here in the audience and is the reason we're here today to discuss a lot of details there that, that is dealing with both enterprise customers as well as the cloud-based customers as well as the telecom operators and of course all the government agencies that uh, we work with. So that will be the focus of today's presentations and panel discussions, but just a couple of words on the other three just to give you some background. Uh, broadband is another major segment of the company which came from the original Broadcom Corporation that I co-founded. Um, and there we deliver broadband technologies to the home, to the office, so all your broadband access, you know, your cable modem, your DSL modems or optical modems, very likely powered by Broadcom Silicon. We, we all the set-top box video technologies that are in your Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, whatever, uh, set-top box products, all likely based on Broadcom Silicon. We're the market leader in providing broadband access and video signal processing in the home. Then on the mobile side, we also have a major business supplying mobile broadband technology. For example, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth technology that's in virtually every major cell phone provider, Apple, Samsung, and others, are all based on Broadcom Silicon. Qualcomm sells the baseband LTE and, and future 5G technologies. We have been the Bluetooth Wi-Fi provider to Apple and Samsung since the beginning since they introduced the iPhone. Also the GPS technology that's part of it. And a lot of the front end radio frequency filters that take the <laughs> multitude of signals coming in the antenna and separate them out for the different bands of operation. That was a core technology that came from the original days of Hewlett Packard, these very ultra tiny filters. So mobile is a major business of ours, again, due to the large customers that we have there in the Apples and Samsungs of the world. And then we have a smaller industrial products group that sells uh, pro various products into the automotive segment, into factory automa automation, alternative energy products, et cetera. Much smaller percentage of the revenue of the company, but an important strategic component. So let's next dive into the uh, 
data center segment, which is the topic of discussion today. So here it's built around these five different product areas or divisions of the company. And on the left, it's the most recent acquisition. CA Technologies provides us with the mainframe software technology and the enterprise software technology. And let's say a few words about that and how the philosophy of the acquisition went. Uh, Hock Tan, our CEO, very much believes in focus and simplification. He wants you to focus on your core business and simplify as much as possible how you do business. So we took the CA product portfolio, which is extremely broad, complicated, and tried to simplify it down into two major segments, the mainframe and the enterprise software segment. And he instilled two general managers to run those, uh, Greg and Ashok, and tried to simplify as much as possible how they do business. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes in terms of not only just simplifying the portfolio, simplifying the customer base, focusing on who really matters as a customer. Where CA had thousands of customers and they had thousands of salespeople running around trying to sell 10 copies of a piece of software to somebody. Where Hawk says, no, focus on who matters. Your largest customers, your most important customers, you know, your top 500 plus customers, where are they? Focus on them. And similarly, in the product side, simplify the portfolio of products. Look at where you're doing the best work, where you have market leadership, where you have the ability to innovate and carry that market leadership forward into building a strong franchise and focus on those. So <clears throat> we'll get into that in the, in the next couple of slides. Then on the right-hand side here, the other segments that complete the data center portfolio, we have a very strong business in networking on the hardware silicon side. The left side of the chart, of course, is all software. The right side is a combination. It's on the networking front, it's mostly silicon. We provide pretty much the, the, the bulk of the switching and routing silicon that goes into most data centers in the world. Uh, we have by far a market leading position there in switching and routing silicon. Also in all the ethernet transport and optical transport that communicate between the racks in your data center all the way out to your metro and uh, wide area networks. So all the ethernet connectivity and optical transport connectivity of a world leading portfolio of products there as well. And then on the storage side, of course, through brocade, having the end product, the brocade fiber channel storage networking products, which is a combination of silicon hardware and software to com complete, uh, complete a complete uh, solution to our customer base. All right, so a few words about Broadcom. Uh, brocade, I'm sorry. Um, so when we acquired Brocade, again, as Hawk's philosophy, focus, 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 simplify, simplify, simplify. So take that core franchise and divest all the other things that aren't important. But Brocade had many different product lines. They were in wireless technologies. They had some Ethernet technology that uh, wasn't all that successful in the market. So we pretty much divested that and just focused the team on the fiber channel storage product that they were the world leader in. They had the best technology, so reinvest to make it even better to expand that portfolio and, and drive that core business. So today it's uh, deploying uh, Gen 6 fiber channel technology. Of course, the R&D is working on Gen 7 and there'll be a Gen 8, whatever, but heavily focused on driving leadership in next-gen products and starting to incorporate more and more intelligence into the software aspects of those products. So there's a lot of automation and advanced analytics, incorporating artificial intelligence into the software stacks on top of the silicon to uh, help you run and operate your networks in a more seamless way. Similarly, on the CA side, same thing again, similar philosophy when the company was acquired, focus. So we took the broad array of products and divided it up into two divisions, 
mainframe products, enterprise software products. So on the enterprise software products, the focus was first, work with the largest customers you have, obviously including government agencies. Find out what they need, support them, and build the products that they need, and don't get distracted with the thousands and thousands of tiny customers out there. Build the products for the big guys, and the little guys would just buy it. Um, so a huge focus there on the upper left on the large customer base. Second, focus on your leading edge products. Whatever you are, wherever you are, a market leader and have best in class products, double down and reinvest in those products, make them even better, adding more features, more technology, rather than try to diversify further and further and further and continue to dilute your R&D resources. Hawk does not believe in that. He believes in, in investing in your core technology to maintain your leadership position and extend it. Then simplify the way you do business with Broadcom. Flexibility, a friction-free access to the portfolio. So the whole process of licensing uh, our products is being transformed to simplify it, to give you portfolio-wide access to our products, simplify the number of contracts as far as Hawk concerned. You know, if we didn't have any lawyers in the company, he would be very happy. Uh, <laughs> So he tries to minimize the complexity. He would like to have one contract per customer, and that's it. You know, so just simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, and then that enables you to innovate, because it frees you up from all the distractions, so you can take that, those R&D dollars in your budget and invest it to make your core products even better. And that is the philosophy that we have. And on the innovation side, AI is an important aspect of what we're doing going forward, trying to make our products smarter to help networks essentially operate somewhat seamlessly. They can uh, analyze the behavior of the network, identify problems in the network, uh, automate as much as possible to allow you to scale and transform your networks as seamlessly as you can. On the mainframe, the philosophy was interesting there as well. Everybody says, oh, mainframe's old technology, and no need to invest in that any further. And absolutely opposite when Broadcom took over. Hawk recognized that mainframes is an essential ingredient to the Fortune 500 companies around the world and the government agencies around there, all using mainframe technology to run their networks, or not entirely, but key mission-critical portions of their networks. So he made the decision to double down even further, to invest even more in the products and in, in, in the people. And I'll say a couple words about that in a minute. Um, on the upper left side, you can see here the, the, the backfill retirement bullet, which is an important one. The, the mainframe industry obviously being a very mature uh, industry for decades, so a lot of the people are nearing retirement age and, who have been mainframe experts over the years. So uh, we're going through a process of replenishing the workforce. So Hawk told Greg that for every person that retires in your group, you can hire two people to backfill them. So he's growing his headcount by more than double digits in the mainframe segment. So hiring, hiring, hiring is his number one priority to build that team. And in terms of the skill set, creating in training these people to come in and, and gain that knowledge, he's also, it's also important to help the customer base maintain their expertise and skill set as their uh, engineers and, and computer scientists begin retiring. So he created this uh, Vitality residency program where at no charge, we're going to provide fully trained expertise in residence to help you bridge the gap. Uh, on any shortfalls in resources that you may have on the mainframe side. So, um, and on the solution side, changing the pricing model, changing the, or simplifying the way you do business with us in terms of a pay-as-you-go type of a model to make it easier for you to uh, decide where you want to invest as far as going into leg more legacy solutions or more uh, futuristic solutions and whether you're going to 
strengthen your cloud infrastructure or you're going to build more on the mainframe. So you need to do balanced investments on both sides. So we want to create a model for you that's easy to do business uh, with us. And in terms of relationships on the bottom right, taking all the people who are in a customer-facing responsibility with the company, whether it's support or training, whatever, pull them into one organization under one leader who's driving all customer-facing issues. So again, simplifying the relationship, simplifying the way you do business, simplify the contracts you do with us, and then we're going to double down by hiring a lot more people to invest in this area and drive that technology and innovation going forward. So to sort of summarize, our goal is to be your trusted partner for helping you modernize and transform your infrastructure to number one on the list, secure, to make it secure, to give you the tools you need to make it secure, and the tools you need to simplify your networks to automate and operate your networks and eliminate IT complexity. So hopefully through the course of the day, you're going to sit through several panel sessions and additional presentations that will get a lot more uh, into the details, but at least I give you here a, a broad overview of where Broadcom is and where our philosophy is going forward. So thank you very much, and you know, if there are any questions from the audience, I'm happy to take them as well. Anybody have any questions? One right here. Oh. A microphone is coming around. So CA Technologies has a ton of legacy software. You know, it's a ver they're well-known industry for being a principal provider of older technologies they acquired and then made available and continued supporting. What is your plan for modernization of those older technologies? Sure. Well, I, the team will get into a lot more detail on that, but it just from a high-level philosophical perspective, if there are products that are still important to our customer base, we will continue to support them, clearly, going forward. And if they are critical to the future of our customer base, we will invest in them going forward. So it's really an issue of, is this a product you held on to just because you had it in the past and you need it to operate for the next 10 years? That's fine. We'll absolutely support it. Will we invest further to add more features and so forth? That depends on you and whether the customer base says, yes, this is a critical piece of technology for us. We need these features. Uh, this is going to drive business going forward. So then, yes, we will invest to make it better. So we will partition the products into legacy products that we support for as long as you need them versus legacy products that we advance and innovate because they are critical parts of your network going forward. Please. Um, so just looking at it as an industry observer, uh, CA has had a business model of uh, maintaining and supporting these legacy technologies. They are quite expensive, or at least compared to some of the alternatives. So we're looking at CA Telon, uh, CoolGen, which used to be TIIEF, and so on. Um, but it's kind of a farming model. You know, it's, it's a... It's a it's a great company. They've got a lot of great assets, great revenue, and so on. But it's fundamentally different from what you're doing at Broadcom because you guys are in the silicon space and you're innovating like crazy. And that's how you succeed in the market. So CA has kind of a different approach, a different culture, uh, well, presumably. Um, I'm wondering how you deal with those kind of cultural differences. I mean, are you going to give uh, people who are using the older stuff a path into more modern software like Java and .NET and stuff like that? Or are you going to just kind of, you know, let them keep going and, you know, keep the licensing model going and um, uh, go down that path? No, it's, it's a good question because it, if you look at the history of the company, the, a lot of these products that we're selling today were invented decades ago. And they've been evolved and evolved and uh, transformed over the years. And a lot of innovation, as you say, has gone into a lot of our products over the years. 
but not all of our products. We have a large base, even on the semiconductor side, of products that don't need to be transformed and modernized. They're just there and they're reused and they do very well. They're supported and, and we kind of say, well, let's focus our energy elsewhere. So it's not all that different. So we do have that philosophy, but on the software side, it's gonna be the same thing. There are places we have to innovate. I mean, AI, security, these are critical technologies that have to evolve going forward. Um, but there are some products that don't need that uh, innovation and they will be maintained. So it's hard for me to, to, to say yes or no one way or another. I think it's both. If people need to innovate, we will give them the resources. They will invest whatever they need to maintain the product leadership because there's a lot of competition out there and we can't sit there blindfolded and ignore what the competition is doing. So in the places where the products need that innovation and need that investment, we'll make that investment. We can't make that investment in every product. It just doesn't make business sense. So we'll have to selectively choose which ones need to innovate on and focus on and which ones need to be supported and maintained. So it'll be a balance, but I think the GMs, the way Hawk is structured, the GMs have a lot of flexibility on choosing which products need that R&D investment and he lets them make that decision. He gives them high level target budgets. You need to hit this kind of revenue, this kind of profit, but in terms of how they spend their R&D budget, as you saw in the first slide, we are one of the largest R&D spenders in the world. So we will spend where necessary to drive innovation going forward to make sure that we retain our customers and, and make them happy with our products. So you are investing a lot in the data center intelligent automation, but the world is, sorry. So you are in investing a lot on the data center intelligent automation, but the world is going towards cloud. So what is your roadmap or what is your vision? in that area? <clears throat> Again, we're gonna do both. I mean, we will invest in both sides. We have major partnerships with all the cloud providers out there, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons of the world. We work with them very closely. They're major, large customers of Broadcom. All of them are top 10 customers of Broadcom. Um, and we build largely the silicon that goes into their data centers. So, um, we know them very well. But on the software side, we again invest in both sides. We have the enterprise, that's how we partition the two divisions of CA now. We have the mainframe division and the enterprise uh, software division. And the enterprise software division focuses more on the cloud customer base. Obviously the mainframe uh, focuses on the mainframe customer base. So we will sustain both investments going forward because they're both important. I mean, the world, is gonna be a, a mix of cloud and mainframe. Mainframes aren't going away. They're mission critical. You know, the customers out there aren't gonna throw out their mainframe. So we will continue the mainframe investment and we will continue the, the cloud investment and evolve with the market. We're not gonna to try to drive the market. We're gonna evolve with the market and do what our customers want. All right, I think I'm getting yanked off the stage. So thank you very much.